Welcome everyone to the next IITE seminar. So today it is my great pleasure to introduce Holly Muller, who's coming from University of California, Santa Barbara. And we're going to be hearing about uh, experimental and mathematical study of acquired metabolism. So without further ado, Holly, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the super kind invitation to be here with you all. It's really um, a, a special treat for me, not only to be part of uh, such a wonderful seminar series, but also to talk to an audience of uh, theoretical ecologists who will share hopefully some of our enthusiasm for using mathematical approaches to understand these systems. Um, before I get started, I do just want to take a moment to acknowledge that I'm zooming in to you today from the campus of University of California, Santa Barbara, which is in Southern California in the United States and uh, sits on the traditional and unceded territories of the Chumash people, particularly the Barbarino band. Um, and for me as an ecologist who often does field work and interacts with the natural environment, uh, I find that it is so important to me to understand the human history of the places where I live and work and understand how that history of stewardship and knowledge uh, really shapes the modern ecology of these systems and continues to shape that ecology in ways that uh, Western science is increasingly uh, learning to acknowledge. If you are, uh, especially if you're based in North America and you're interested in that human history of place, uh, nativeland.ca, this uh, website up here is a really tremendous resource that maps the indigenous territories, particularly in North America to learn more. In addition, I wanna acknowledge a really fantastic team of collaborators that I've had the absolute privilege of working with um, over the last seven years here at UC Santa Barbara, some of whom are pictured here, some of whom you'll meet as I talk about some of the work that we've been up to, um, and also gratefully acknowledge funding from a variety of sources uh, in North America over the years that have funded the work that I'll talk to you about today. So what I have in common uh, with this, this group of people pictured here is that we are all to some extent community ecologists, which means that we are fascinated by the interactions that species have with one another, and in particular, how the metabolism of organisms shapes those interactions. So if we were to go out into an ecosystem, so I'll, I'll take you here to one of my favorite places in the world, coastal British Columbia and a, a fjord system. You can see the harbor with some lucky uh, affluent people with their boats based there and then the mountains in the background and so on. But if we were to go to an ecosystem like this and think about the organisms that we are seeing or that we know are there, we would notice that they have different forms of metabolism. So for example, in the background, these Douglas fir trees are autotrophs, which means that they use the energy of sunlight to to fix organic carbon, to produce organic carbon for themselves. Whereas heterotrophs like the salmon, a, a really canonical species or canonical fish of the Pacific Northwest are heterotrophic, which means that they need to obtain their organic carbon from another organism for their growth and reproduction. And the metabolism that these organisms utilize shape their ecological role or what an ecologist would call their niche in an ecosystem shapes how they gain their energy and of course how they interact with other species, for example, in a food web where our primary producers like our trees and our phytoplankton are really setting the table for the higher trophic levels, including the salmon. And these heterotrophic species may serve as more intermediate trophic linkages as energy and materials are passed up the food chain to things like uh, orcas and um, eagles. Now, as an ecologist, right, it's tempting to say, okay, if I can understand an organism's metabolism, then I can make some predictions about how it will uh, contribute to the community and the ecosystem structure that surrounds and supports and sustains our own human life. And hopefully predicting that metabolism is straightforward because biology textbooks suggest to us that metabolism is, is fixed, is sort of encoded or hardwired into an organism's DNA which then gives rise to the cells and the organelles inside of those cells and proteins inside of those cells that carry out metabolic reactions and also instructs the assembly of these cells into the whole organism with its emergent metabolism that arises from the, these genetic properties. In this case, uh, fortunately for me, when I ride my bike home at night, an extinct uh, velociraptor uh, carnivore species. But, also, as biologists, right, we know that life is never so simple and, and biology loves to break rules. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is how biology breaks the rule that metabolism is encoded in DNA through the acquisition of metabolism. 
And when I talk about acquired metabolism today, what I'm referring to are metabolic capabilities that are not encoded within the organism's genome, but which instead that organism gains access to within its lifetime through some type of interaction with another species. And by acquiring that metabolism, that organism is able to expand its metabolic niche with implications for its contemporary ecology and for its evolutionary history and, and future. So to make the concept of acquired metabolism a little bit more concrete, I'd like to give you an example. Um, so corals are heterotrophic animals like you and I. That means they're reliant on a source of organic carbon from another species for their growth and, and reproduction. And in many parts of the world's oceans, such as in the deep North Atlantic and the Darwin Mounds, corals live heterotrophically, <clears throat> excuse me, by filter feeding smaller organisms out of the water column and digesting them. But when I say coral, or when I use the phrase coral reef, probably what comes to mind for most of us is something more like the image on the right. This is a tropical coastal coral reef. This particular one is in the Big Island of Hawaii. Um, and it's a place that many of us uh, would like to visit or, or have visited because the water is so clear. We can snorkel and dive and, and have great visibility and really see this hot spot of biodiversity and all the life that accumulates there. But the clarity of the water, even as it makes that reef so compelling to visit, also tells us something about the food supply that's available for a filter feeding heterotrophic coral animal, which is that there's not too much there. Uh, so corals have had to find a way to live in this food depleted environment. And the way that they've done this is through the acquisition of metabolism. So if we were to zoom in on a head of coral and look at a couple of coral polyps here, you can see the translucent tissue of the animal there. And then in the middle, you can see this brown green coloration. These are photosynthetic algae, uh, zooxanthellae or symbiogeneaceae, dinoflagellates that are living inside of the coral tissue, photosynthesizing and providing that organic material, providing that photosynthate to the coral in exchange for um, housing and exchange for uh, nitrate and other uh, uh, nutrients. And so through the acquisition of photosynthesis by harnessing these photosynthetic endosymbionts, corals have been able to make a living and not just make a living, but create these hotspots of biodiversity in parts of the world's oceans that we would not expect a filter feeding heterotroph to otherwise be able to survive. So this acquisition of metabolism is happening at the scale of a whole organism. It's what we would call a metabolic mutualism. So mutually beneficial interaction mediated in this case by the exchange of metabolites. Of course, though, acquisitions can happen at other biological scales as well. For example, through horizontal gene transfer and the lateral movement of uh, the genes that encode different forms of metabolism. For those of you interested in antibiotic resistance and biomedical applications, this is, of course, very important to that process. Um, but acquisitions can also happen at the subcellular level through the retention of functional machinery. And I'll talk more about that in the second half of the talk today. So in our group at UCSB, we're really interested in understanding how this acquired metabolism both creates contemporary ecological opportunity and also can enable evolutionary innovation by lineages that are capable of extending their metabolism and sort of letting that metabolism jump across the tips of the tree of the branches of life, or tips of the branches of the tree of life. Um, and so I, I'd like to share with you a couple of vignettes uh, from our work. And I'm going to start at the level of the whole organism thinking about metabolic mutualism. Now, uh, fortunately for us, uh, but perhaps unfortunately for the Jurassic fan, uh, Park fans amongst us, we do not work on a metabolic mutualism that involves velociraptors and presumably their gut microbiome. Uh, but we do work on what I think is the equally charismatic and, and certainly more contemporarily ecologically important metabolic mutualism between trees and ectomycorrhizal fungi. So as all of us who have ever uh, gone hiking in a forested landscape appreciate, the business of trees above ground is photosynthesis. And in order to photosynthesize as efficiently as possible, trees need to obtain resources from below ground, namely nutrients and water. Now in temperate ecosystems, like where I live in, in Santa Barbara and points north or in the southern hemisphere, point south of this latitude, most of the trees that I encounter in my day-to-day -day life obtain those resources through association with a group of fungi called ectomycorrhizae. So these light micrographs here show you a few examples of what those ectomycorrhizal root tips look like. So the physical structure here, that branching structure is the tree's root system. And then the coloration, and you can see in a few places these threads of fungal hyphal fibers coming off of those root structures, 
That's the fungal tissue that's fitting like a glove around the tree's root system. And it's there at the interface between plant and fungal tissue that resource exchange is taking place. In particular, the trees are paying the fungi with photosynthate, so they're paying them carbon, uh, and that fu the fungi are using that energy source to grow and reproduce, but also to spread through the soil and produce enzymes that allow them to break down recalcitrant soil organic matter and liberate some of those nutrients, which they deliver in turn to the tree. So in the language of acquired metabolism, then, we have trees really acquiring access to enzymatic abilities that the fungi have, but the tree does not. So broadening their phenotype and extending their niche uh, through this metabolic mutualism. And the fungi are essentially acquiring this big carbon straw into the sky. So they're acquiring access to organic matter uh, and essentially indirectly harnessing the power of sunlight to support their own growth. Now, one of the things that has been fascinating to me personally and, and to many ecologists and mycologists for decades is that this symbiosis is actually exceptionally diverse. So if we were to go out to um, you know, a, a, an oak woodland or a pine woodland here in, even in Southern California and excavate the root system of an entire tree, we would find upwards of several dozen different species of ectomycorrhizal fungi simultaneously coexisting on that one tree's root system, which for us as theoreticians raises some questions, right? Because our conventional understanding of mutualism involves this idea that mutualism should select for partner specificity to prevent the invasion of cheaters. So how is it that we have this proliferation of, of diversity on these tree root systems? The canonical explanation for this is that species diversity is linked to functional diversity. So uh, different fungi will operate in different strata of the soil. They will produce different types of enzymes, which enable them to provide different resources to the tree. And they might vary in the time of year, season, uh, type of environmental conditions in which they are most active. And so if you are a tree who, uh, you know, by nature, is long lived and cannot physically move to new locations, and you're confronted with environments that vary in both space and time, having a portfolio of fungi, you, you might rather, um, you might need different fungi in different environmental circumstances. At the same time, these ectomycorrhizal fungi are solely dependent on their host tree as their source of carbon. So what that means is that if you're going to need a fungus five years from now, you need to start maintaining it today because otherwise that fungus will not be present in your ecosystem for you to engage with when the environment changes. So in other words, you can't turn over your complement of fungal partners instantaneously. So that leads us to a hypothesis that trees might actually employ a sort of bet hedging strategy in which they maintain a more diverse, a more speciose fungal portfolio in response to variable environmental conditions because that allows them to sort of be pre-prepared uh, pre or to be prepared for uh, changes in the environment as they should arise. And so this question of, of whether temporal variability in environmental conditions could promote bet hedging strategies in a mutualism is one that was originally tackled by Kristen Klitgaard, a former undergraduate researcher in our group, and then carried forward by Dr. Laura Bogar, who's now an assistant professor at UC Davis and, and currently really being um, beautifully uh, polished up by Dr. Bethany Stevens, who's a current postdoctoral researcher in our group. And what we've done is acknowledge that Asking these questions about bet hedging in trees in the outside world is extremely challenging, right? Imagine uh, being the PhD student who's told your thesis chapter is going to take 20 years to collect the necessary data. And so I would argue that this is exactly the sort of circumstance where the use of mathematical models can be extremely powerful because we can experiment numerically in ways that just aren't tractable uh, in nature or even in the greenhouse. And so what we did was develop a mathematical model where we considered a host tree that has two potential partners, red fungus and a blue fungus. And let's say that this tree is existing in an environment, we'll call it environment type A, where the red fungus is the higher quality partner. You just get a higher return on investment from that fungus in this particular environment. In such a case, we would expect the tree to choose, whether we mean that in, over evolutionary time, uh, to invest only in the high quality partner, thereby eliminating the blue fungus from the system because that fungus is not receiving any carbon rewards. Now we can imagine a sort of 
mirror image environment, we'll call it environment B, where the blue fungus is the highest quality partner and the red fungus should be eliminated. But then the question arises, what happens when the tree experiences a fluctuating environment such that it spends some time in environment A, some time in environment B, and it might switch back and forth with some periodicity? So we can use our model to ask how the tree's performance, so we'll use tree biomass on the y-axis there as our proxy for fitness, imagining that larger trees have more carbon available uh, to do things like reproduction. We can ask how that tree biomass depends on environmental conditions and on the tree's investment strategy. So on the x-axis here, we're looking at environments that range from being 100% of type A, where that red fungus is the most beneficial, to 100% of type B, where the blue fungus is the most beneficial, and then a 50-50 mix of environmental conditions in the middle. So let's first consider a tree that invests solely in the red fungus. And unsurprisingly to us, that's a tree that's going to do best in environment A. And actually, at some point, there's too much of environment B for that tree to even survive anymore without that other partner. And of course, a tree that has the opposite investment strategy solely in fungus B has the opposite result. But a tree that invests equally in both fungi, uh, so it maintains equal proportions of fungus A, or of the red and blue fungus, actually is able to homogenize its experience across all of these environments. In so doing, it does experience a fitness cost in the environmental extreme. So you can see that purple horizontal line there is lower than the uh, maxima of the red and blue curves. Uh, but its fitness is higher, its biomass is higher when environmental conditions are variable. So this is kind of a canonical bet hedging result, right, where you would accept a fitness cost in the extreme environments in order to benefit from the reduced variance and have a higher performance when the environment is variable. Now, it's one thing to say, okay, we see bet hedging results in uh, in our hypothetical models. It's another to ask whether we see evidence for bet hedging actually out in nature. And uh, so a project that I'm super excited about that is in progress, so, so please stay tuned, that we're working on now, asks uh, whether we see that evidence for bet hedging in a couple of ways. Um, so the first thing that we're doing is growing up a lot of seedlings in the greenhouse and splitting their root systems so that we can control the quality of partners on either side of their root system and ask whether we see that these trees actually leak some of their carbon to the low quality partner, which would be an indication of a tree that has this bet hedging or mixed investment strategy um, that's going to maintain a more wide portfolio of fungi than just the present highest quality partner. And we're also going out into the field across a gradient of environmental variation to ask whether we see a positive relationship between fungal diversity and environmental variability out in the field, particularly in Northern California working on Douglas fir trees. Um, and so, you know, I think this combination of a, a theoretical framework and then trying to validate it uh, using experiments can not only help us understand this particular case of acquired metabolism, but tells us something a little bit broader about mutualism as well. So as I mentioned to you a, a few minutes ago, in mutualism theory, we tend to think about um, evolution as selecting for partner specificity so that you should have sort of a one-to-one -one match between host and partner in order to prevent the invasion of cheaters. But in situations like what trees and ectomycorrhizal fungi experience, we might actually see that a more general investment strategy, even if it means sometimes making mistakes and bringing along fungi that don't end up being beneficial to you, could actually be beneficial when the environment fluctuates by allowing you to be better prepared for an unknown future that might change from the tree's perspective over the course of a year, over the course of multiple years, or over the course of decades. And so what we see by studying this acquired metabolism example is that it's really creating ecological opportunity. These fungi sort of act as, as different uh, hats or different wardrobes that the, the tree can put on to match itself to environmental conditions, allowing the trees to extend their phenotypes and, and tolerate different environmental conditions. But in so doing, uh, these trees wind up having to confront a relatively complex investment problem in terms of the portfolio of fungi they should maintain, which challenges this kind of conventional wisdom of always choosing the highest quality partner at any given time. So having thought for a bit about acquisitions at the scale of the whole organism and, and metabolic mutualism, I want to shift gears to the subcellular level to talk a little bit about organelle retention. 
And for me, one of the most fascinating examples of this is the movement of the chloroplast, which is the eukaryotic organelle for photosynthesis, which in our biology textbooks, we learn about as an organelle that uh, plants and algae, eukaryotic algae acquired a long time ago that is now permanently incorporated into their metabolic repertoire, allowing them to be photosynthetic. But of course, in biology, we have rule breakers. And so there are actually organisms alive today, many species that eat other species that are genotypically heterotrophic themselves, go out and consume something photosynthetic and then retain those chloroplasts and become transiently photosynthetic themselves. So that is a pretty, in my opinion, profound example of acquired metabolism to transform yourself from a heterotroph to a primary producer through the acquisition of cellular machinery. It's something I feel jealous of when I eat a salad, or even if I have a piece of lettuce on my hamburger, right? Imagine being able to turn my arms green and get all the energy I need in the Santa Barbara sunshine here. Um, but in addition to just the biological curiosity of it, I would argue that understanding these contemporary acquired phototrophs, which are what we call kleptoplastidic or chloroplastiline, we also gain insight into the evolutionary process that gave rise to our modern eukaryotic photosynthetic organisms. And I'm alluding here, of course, to the endosymbiosis hypothesis, which is our best understanding of how eukaryotes gain photosynthesis in the first place. So to the best of our knowledge, based on a geological evidence, uh, photosynthesis was evolved about two and a half billion years ago, but it was evolved by prokaryotes. So uh, not eukaryotic organisms, organisms without an organelle or structure. And it was only when an early eukaryotic cell ingested one of these free living cyanobacteria and domesticated it, that we got this primary endosymbiosis event that gave rise to the first chloroplast about 2 billion years ago and enabled eukaryotes to have access to photosynthesis at all. Now this primary endosymbiosis event gave rise to two major lineages of algae, the greens and the reds. The greens of course going on to become our modern day land plants. But in aquatic systems, there have been a series of at least half a dozen secondary endosymbiosis events and even some tertiary, we think, endosymbiosis events by which other heterotrophic lineages have eaten a eukaryote with a chloroplast and then incorporated that chloroplast into their own metabolism. And that's given rise to this huge uh, extant biodiversity of eukaryotic phytoplankton in aquatic ecosystems today. And I would argue that if we can understand the evolution of acquired phototrophs today, we might be able to gain some insight into the types of selection pressures and mechanisms that gave rise to the current uh, portfolio of eukaryotic phytoplankton that we see on the planet. So if I'm gonna argue that acquired phototrophs, that these kleptoplastidic organisms are an evolutionary intermediary between heterotrophic ancestral states and modern day photosynthetic organism that has permanently incorporated a chloroplast, then I have to sort of figure out what the key evolutionary innovations are that allow this transition. The first of these is the evolved ability to retain a chloroplast. Uh, and of course here, when I say a key innovation, I'm amalgamating many sub steps that would have to happen along the way. But in order to go from a heterotroph to an acquired phototroph, you have to figure out how to hold on to that organelle that you have ingested. And in order to permanently incorporate photosynthesis into your metabolic repertoire, you then have to evolve the ability to replicate that plastid and pass it on to your daughter cells when you divide, such that that photosynthesis is permanently incorporated into your metabolic repertoire. So Grace Casares, former undergraduate researcher, and Dr. Alexandra Brown, a former postdoc in our group, got interested in exploring this question, again, using mathematical models, because trying to observe this evolutionary process in nature is extremely challenging. So what Grace and Alexandra did was work with an existing model of acquired phototroph of acquired phototrophy, in which we have a phytoplankton that's growing photosynthetically and sharing the water column with a consumer. When these consumers capture and eat one of these phytoplankton, they are able to retain that chloroplast represented by that green oval there and use it for photosynthesis. But this is only transient acquisition of photosynthesis. And so when these consumers reproduce photosynthetically or when their plastids inevitably decay, they wind up back in the heterotrophic state where they have to feed again to obtain a chloroplast in order to continue to grow photosynthetically. 
And so our consumer is sort of alternating between these two photosynthetic and heterotrophic states mediated by the acquisition of metabolism from the prey cell. What Grace and Alexandra did was say, let's modify this model to allow for this evolutionary spectrum from heterotrophy to phototrophy. So first, the first modification that they did was allow predation to lead directly to the heterotrophic growth of the consumer. And that gives us a single parameter, the retention probability, where that uh, governs how many of these chloroplasts get retained versus the prey cell being immediately digested and used for heterotrophic growth. And so if you never retain the plastid, then you wind up with your sort of standard predator prey model. And if the retention happens 100% of the time, you wind up back at the original model. The second modification they made was to allow plastids to be replicated. And that gives us a replication parameter, where if we set that parameter equal to one, such that every time you divide, you also make a chloroplast for your daughter cell, then you wind up with a model of a true eukaryotic phytoplankton that has permanently incorporated photosynthesis into its metabolic repertoire. So that means then that we have two parameters representing these two key evolutionary innovations of plastid retention and plastid replication. And we can ask how these organisms should evolve as a function of different environmental conditions. In particular, to do this, Alexandra and Grace used a mathematical suite of tools called adaptive dynamics. And uh, for those of you who have not used adaptive dynamics before, essentially the way that it works is that we imagine an organism in an ancestral state. In this case, that would be our heterotroph that neither retains nor replicates plastids. And then we ask what happens if there's a mutation to uh, some or one of the individuals in this population that increases its retention or replication parameter? Would that mutant have a higher fitness? And if so, would it invade and take over the population? And we can repeat this invasion selection uh, dynamic many dozens of times to simulate hypothetical evolutionary trajectories. So for example, in this case, we have an organism that has evolved to retain a chloroplast um, and be really like our contemporary acquired phototrophs, but ultimately to get all the way up to having a replication parameter of one, such that 100% of the time it's passing on these plastids to its daughter cells and therefore behaving very much like a true eukaryotic phytoplankton. And if we run this model many dozens of times, what we find is that in general, the trajectory is towards the permanent evolution of photosynthesis or the permanent incorporation of photosynthesis. But that result depends upon environmental conditions. So if we, for example, alter the light availability for the system, we can see different evolutionary outcomes, ranging from this first solution that we saw in the previous slide, this phytoplankton-like incorporation permanently of the chloroplast with 100% replication, or the second solution where these organisms evolve to not bother to try to copy these plastids at all, but instead just transiently acquire photosynthesis by retaining chloroplasts every time they ingest a prey cell. So once again, we're confronted with a mathematical model that makes some predictions for us, but then a question of how would we validate that model or, or could we see things that indicate that our model has meaning beyond the in silico simulations. And what's really cool, in my opinion, of uh, about studying acquired phototrophs in particular, is that we actually have a model system that I think illustrates these hypothetical endpoints of the model. And that is the Mesodinium genus. Uh, this is a group of marine ciliates that, uh, whose members span a gradient of reliance on photosynthesis all the way from being entirely heterotrophic to being almost entirely photosynthetic. The most famous of these species is a, a little ciliate called Mesodinium rubrum, which gets more than 95% of the carbon in its energy budget from photosynthesis, despite the fact that it is stealing those chloroplasts from cryptophyte algae. And it became widely recognized, actually, because it's so good at growing photosynthet photosynthetically that it can form red tides. So it can form blooms that are dense enough to actually color the water red, as shown here in this image from the Columbia River estuary. Now, within the same genus, uh, there's a sister species to Mesodinium rubrum called Mesodinium chameleon. And if you're wondering uh, whether chameleon uh, indicates what you think it indicates, indeed, this is a ciliate that can change color depending on the colors of the uh, uh, chloroplasts in the cryptophyte algae that it consumes. So this light micrograph here shows you an example of this, the larger sort of bilobate cells 
are our mesodinium chameleon cells. And you can see one off to the left that's red, one near the top that's blue green, one on the right side that's got a mouthful of sort of both types of chloroplasts. So we can actually feed these guys different cryptophyte algae and they'll readily retain their chloroplasts and, and change color accordingly. Mesodinium chameleon is a, what we would call mixotrophic. So it gets about half of its energy from photosynthesis and half from heterotrophy. And then there's a third uh, lineage, Mesodinium pulix, which is entirely heterotrophic and does not retain chloroplasts at all. So what we have then across this genus are members representing a hypothetical heterotrophic ancestral state, a highly photosynthetic state in Mesodinium rubrum, where we have a cell that if we feed it relatively recently, it can in fact actually divide those chloroplasts and pass them on to its daughter cells. And then a hypothetical intermediate or alternate evolutionary strategy in mesodinium chameleon that is not very good at maintaining or repairing its chloroplasts, but is extremely good at retaining them from uh, any cryptophyte algae, almost any cryptophyte algae that it encounters. So if we've worked quite a bit on the ecology and the photophysiology of these lineages to try to place them on the spectrum and understand how that helps them to achieve ecological success in different environments. And now increasingly, we're starting to look under the hood and ask, well, okay, how are these organisms actually pulling this off? What are the actual mechanics within the cell that allow for this transition from heterotrophy to phototrophy? So Dr. Chris Pate, who's a former postdoctoral researcher in our group, decided to tackle this by using a transcriptomic approach. So we sequenced uh, the RNA, so the expressed genes of these ciliates, and asked how gene expression varied across this gradient of reliance and photosynthesis. I expected, of course, that there would be major differences in carbon metabolism because uh, your energy acquisition is going to look really different if you're using a chloroplast versus if you are ingesting free living prey and, and simply digesting them. What I did not expect is that what Chris found is that the more photosynthetic these lineages are, the more they rely on their prey, not just for a source of carbon, but also for a source of, uh, as a source of all other aspects of metabolism. What I'm showing you here on the left, the spider plot or radar plot, is an indication of the spectrum of different metabolic genes across uh, six different categories here that these ciliates are actively expressing. So they might still have these genes in their genome, but they do not appear to be turning them on or, or using them, at least under the environmental conditions in which we grew them. And the envelopes here that you're seeing, those colorful envelopes show you how many or what proportion of these genes are being expressed by different lineages. And what you can notice is the heterotrophic mesodinium pulix and the more mixotrophic mesodinium chameleon and yellow and blue have much larger metabolic envelopes. The ciliates are doing much more than highly photosynthetic mesodinium rubrum. We've got two mesodinium rubrum strains represented here, one in red and one in orange. So for example, if we look at the amino acids and we look in particular at the biosynthesis of amino acids, here the filled boxes represent amino acids that the ciliate we think can make and the empty boxes indicate that we don't think the ciliate can make that amino acid. And you can see that the highly photosynthetic mesodinium rubrum lineages are missing, we think, the capacity to manufacture a lot of these amino acids for themselves. Mesodinium rubrum is also missing a lot of the key genes or is not expressing a lot of the key genes associated with fatty acid oxidation and with peroxisome production, indicating that it's relying increasingly on its prey, not just as a source of carbon, but as a source of other metabolites as well. So what this suggests to us is that acquired metabolism can shape the evolutionary trajectories of these lineages. Not only does kleptoplasty give an, or a lineage a window to potentially evolve towards permanent phototrophy, but it may be the case that acquiring one form of metabolism then sort of causes this cascade of increasing reliance on other forms of metabolism as well. And although I don't have time to chat with you about this today, um, we are increasingly interested in this acquisition history because we think it shapes the potential that these lineages ultimately have for evolution in their future. So the complement of metabolism that you got when you obtained that chloroplast and how that locked that chloroplast into a certain configuration may shape how you evolve in future.
So in summary, what we've seen through a couple of examples are ways in which acquired metabolism can expand an organism's niche and impact its ecology and its evolution. So in our example of the metabolic mutualism between trees and ectomycorrhizal fungi, we've seen how this fungal diversity can um, extend the phenotype of the host tree, but also impact uh, how that tree can manage its portfolio of partners. And then in the case of our uh, kleptoplasty acquired photosynthesis example in microbes, we've seen how these acquisitions can really fundamentally transform the source of metabolism that these organisms rely upon and also shape their past and, and future metabolic evolution. So I'll end there um, because I'm super excited to have a lively discussion with you all. Um, but anything we don't get to, I'm absolutely happy to follow up uh, by email or on that website formerly known as Twitter. Um, and I'll also note that uh, we really are a super collaborative group and, and keen to work with folks who have similar interests or um, uh, are are interested in any of these systems or any of the others that we work on. And we are almost always actively recruiting postdocs, especially those who have empirical interests in tree fungal or um, ciliate kleptoplasty systems. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Molly. That was a fantastic talk. So as usual, on this platform that is currently known as Zoom, uh, we're going <laughs> to be uh, taking questions. So please raise your hand in the participant list if you have any questions. Any questions? Yes. Hi, um, <clears throat> thanks for the talk. This was fantastic. Um, so I have like one question and a half sort of thing. So in your last part of the talk, when you're talking about the mesodinium and their kleptoplasticity, and you showed in this very end how, uh, you know, being able to be not fully, but like almost fully reliant on, um, chloroplasts kind of, you know, decreases their capacity to function without it. So mm -hmm. would you agree that this evolutionary path has sort of a cost of acquired metabolism? Yeah, I th that's a super insightful uh, question, Aldo, and I definitely think that. Um, I, uh, for a long time, I sort of saw mesodinium rubrum. So I was fortunate actually to start working on mesodinium rubrum when I was an undergraduate, believe it or not. And so um, when I was first working on it, I, I sort of, I thought, gee, you know, here's a, a little bug that's kind of the mastermind of the universe here. It figured out how to pluck away someone's photosynthetic machinery and use it. But then as I studied it more, I was like, but also it got stuck with that. So if it can't find the prey cell, it can't, gain access to photosynthesis and mesodinium rubrum and chameleon actually they will die in darkness um so they are obligate phototrophs even as they have to obtain that chloroplast from another lineage and in the case of mesodinium rubrum what i think we're seeing is that it's getting even more complicated because they're getting more and more specialized i didn't mention this but um not only do they need to steal chloroplast but they need to steal it from a particular species of cryptophyte algae and so that specialization is kind of ratcheting them along this evolutionary pathway and in the modern eukaryotic phytoplankton, we've seen lineages that have solved that by permanently incorporating the chloroplast into their metabolic repertoire so that they can now vertically transmit it instead of needing to find a prey item and steal it. Ciliates have genetic weirdness that I think makes it challenging for them to permanently incorporate the chloroplast. But um, yeah, that might be why they're stuck there and, and maybe they're headed towards a dead end. <laughs> So super cool and uh, like i just have a quick follow-up so did, were you able to uh, i'm assuming that these uh, results came after the modeling paper that you showed to us all and i was wondering if there has like now that you know about this you know quote unquote cost can you incorporate that easily back into the model and see whether or not those trajectories that you showed us that go you know towards a, an evolution of autotrophy be more actually dampened because of the cost? Yeah, absolutely. So I um, the model that we currently have 
doesn't necessarily have the, the metabolic details to incorporate these specific costs. But we did incorporate um, a trade-off in our evolutionary model already, which uh, assigns a cost of being good at retaining the chloroplast linking that to a reduction in your success at capturing prey. So we reduced attack rate as the retention of the chloroplast got better and better. And we did that as kind of a, um, a sort of phenomenological finding where we know that the highly photosynthetic mesodinium lineages have a reduced suite of prey and also seem to eat less. Um, but it also was important for getting, you know, those alternate evolutionary trajectories where you can decide, hey, you know what, I'm going to be really good at catching and eating prey, and I'm not going to attempt to retain that chloroplast or to repair that chloroplast um, very well. But I, yeah, it's definitely a fascinating area for us and uh, something that we're moving forward in the future going to try to incorporate more of the metabolic uh, details of the system in our models. Thank you. Yeah. Eric? Please go ahead. Hey. Hi, Holly. Great talk. Hi. Thanks. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, yeah, so I was curious about the... Um, so about the path, like the hypothesized pathway to UK, like to UK, like, like secondary endosymbiosis here. And I, mm -hmm. I think at least like, I guess teaching this stuff at the intro level, I feel like canonically we always often talk about plastid acquisition as like, okay, you take up a whole eukaryote and then that eukaryote kind of re keeps track of the plastid and like, and then eventually incorporate that. It, and I, you know, I guess part of what I always assumed was why we, assume that was kind of the mechanism was that like there has to be at least some gene transfer from the nucleus to support those plastids, right? Like it, it's not only the plastids not only being raised from the actual um, genes in the plastid itself. So is there evidence of like nuclear transmission like of genes required for the plastid into these mesodiniums? And I guess the other thing is like, do we see sort of canonical like examples of secondary endosymbiosis? Like, Third or third, you know, tertiary or, or quaternary membranes. Like, are you actually seeing an extra membrane around these plastids too? Yeah, great question. So Eric is is rightfully pointing out that in the organisms in the lineages that have permanently incorporated photosynthesis in our modern eukaryotic phy phytoplankton, we see um, sometimes we see remnants of the nucleus of the originally free living cell. Um, certainly the plastid itself has a, a little um, plasmid in it, a little chloroplast genome. And then sometimes we'll see remnants of the genome of the cell that was free living and then became this new uh, eukaryotic chloroplast with additional membranes around it. Um, and we'll often see different numbers of membranes around the plastid, which indicate to us how many times that plastid has been kind of has changed hands. Um, what I didn't tell you about mesodinium uh, and about ciliates is a little bit about their genomic architecture, which kind of informs us on this. So ciliates are weird for many reasons. Um, but one of the weird things about ciliates is that they actually have two types of nuclei. And so I brought us back to the slide so I could sort of point out to you, the small little red dot here, that's the micronucleus of the ciliate. That is uh, its germline copy of its DNA. Ciliates also have macronuclei. In the case of mesodinium rubrum, they have two macronuclei and one micronucleus. These macronuclei are sort of like Think of the micronucleus as the textbook and the macronucleus as the notebook. So when you're taking a class, you've written down like some of the parts of the textbook that your teacher told you were important, and maybe you've written them down several times and you've written them down in your own words. So the macronucleus has the micronucleus information, a subset of it, downloaded with some rearrangement and some splicing. So what that means is for a ciliate to obtain photosynthesis, what would probably have to happen is you'd have to get the genes horizontally transferred first into the macronucleus where gene expression is actually happening, and then into the micronucleus where you're now in the germline as opposed to the somatic nucleus, so that then when the ciliate undergoes sexual reproduction, that gene is still there. Um, we have, so we have a currently very rough draft assembly of a genome for mesodinium rubrum. 
If you squint at it, maybe there's some evidence of horizontal gene transfer, but nothing that I'm going to like stake my reputation on right now. But what Mesodinium rubrum does, which kind of solves this problem for it, is that it steals a prey nucleus too. So that's what this little yellow circle is here. So Mesodinium rubrum is like, I'm going to steal the car and I'm going to steal the owner's manual for the car. And then I'm going to use the owner's manual to take really good care of the car and make sure the car gets a lot of miles out of it. Whereas, you know, Mesodinium pulex doesn't steal the car at all. And Mesodinium chameleon steals the car and then immediately crashes it and moves on to a new car. Um, so by stealing the prey nucleus, these prey nuclei are transcriptionally active inside of the Mesodinium rubrum cell. And they are supporting uh, the, the growth and reproduction and maintenance of the chloroplasts. And we think they're also supporting these other forms of metabolism as well. And so that might be sort of that, that kernel of information um, that allows the cell to actually become increasingly more reliant on prey metabolism. So uh, one thing I was wondering is that when you were showing the uh, model with the temporal variation, so what was, you've had environments and there was some mixing going from mm -hmm. zero to 100 to 100 to zero. Mm -hmm. uh, but so how should one imagine this? Was there autocorrelation or is it just a, a, a uncorrelated environment? Uh, no, it's it's an extremely simple. Um, I can't remember the time step for this particular figure. Of course, the time step does matter, but um, extremely simple, like five years in environment A, five years in environment B, and then you just flip back and forth in this very predictable way. Be periodic. Uh, periodic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, okay. Yeah, and so. Um, Unsurprisingly, I think for, for those of us on this call as theoreticians, um, another result that we know um, from the bet hedging literature is that when environments fluctuate extremely rapidly or extremely slowly, bet hedging is no longer um, a, a sort of fitness maximizing strategy because if the environment fluctuates rapidly, you just wait it out. And if the environment fluctuates slowly, well, you should just you know bank on the environment that you're in today. Um, and so there's definitely a window of the frequency of change of these periodic environments that gives rise to bet hedging as, as the preferred strategy. Okay, okay. yeah, thank you. Uh, no, that, 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 that's a good point to emphasize. I'm also wondering about, uh, coming back to the point you mentioned about cheaters, that mm -hmm. uh, when there is this kind of uh, environmental variation, does that affect the evolution of the fungi? And does it open opportunities for cheaters to come in or or that's known not to happen? It's a great question. Um, and something that we wrestle with in the models as well, right? Because even if you invoke these arguments for needing a particular partner in particular circumstances, you can still destabilize this model if you put in a, a true cheater. Um, as an empiricist, I would say that we have good evidence that these organisms are engaged in signaling and partner recognition and sanction. It's just that these sanctions seem imperfect. So I would say, you know, if we think about where an ectomycorrhizal tree actually is along the spectrum, uh, plants, we have evidence from greenhouse studies that use those types of split root systems to assess where the tree or, or other herbaceous plants are, are directing their investments, we see evidence that they have preferential responses. So they will preferentially direct them to the higher quality partners. However, the low quality partner often hangs out for a while and is not completely eliminated. And so that's what to me suggests that, you know, maybe there's some mix here where if you don't have any sanctions at all, you'll be overrun by cheaters but an imperfect sanction or a leaky strategy, if you will, allows you to maintain a more diverse portfolio of fungi. And then if you are in a fluctuating environment, if you are a long-lived organism, um, it may you know, result in these bet hedging-esque outcomes. Oh, thanks, thanks so much.
Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, maybe maybe I will want to ask one more thing, which is uh, I I wonder maybe maybe it is very simple to answer, and maybe it is impossible. In which case, forget <laughs> it. But uh, when you were talking about the um, adaptive model for for mm -hmm. uh, uh, evolving photosynthesis, then mm -hmm. you mentioned that plastid replication is one of the traits that can mm -hmm. evolve. Mm -hmm. Is that really a quantity? Exactly that one. It, mm -hmm. Is that a quantitative trait, really? Uh, naively, one would think that the difference between zero and anything except zero is vast, and then anything beyond that is a bit who cares. Yeah, uh, no, I think that's an excellent point. Um, the way that we thought of it to kind of approximate it in this way relates to the question that Eric asked about gene transfer. And we were thinking about it as maybe a spectrum of how many genes you have, how well you can take care of that plastid. And so there might be a difference. You might be able, and I agree that the ability to let the plastid divide inside of yourself feels like a binary yes or no thing, but the quality of the product that you get out of that, and therefore the longevity of that plastid could depend on what other machinery you have to support and sustain that. So we were kind of smearing a bit the replication and, and repair mechanisms into this, um, this sort of uh, trait with this kind of continuous variation from zero to one. That makes perfect sense. Thanks so much. And I'll shut up and let John ask his question. <laughs> Hi, John. Hey, Holly. Great to see you. Wonderful talk as always. Thank you. Um, uh, so this whole cilia genomics thing has been breaking my brain for a little uh -huh. while. Um, and, and I was sorry, just, we're in the same club. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just wondering maybe, uh, um, if there's like a, an intermediate sort of temporary, uh, ability that could, um, that they could gain for replicating the, um, the plasmid. Um, in the macronucleus, right? Because that's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're replicating in there and they're pinching those yeah. apart. Seems like there might be some opportunity to um, import, you know, the little nucleus into there and just kind of run it. But mm -hmm. then eventually when they conjugate, then they're going to lose it, right? Mm -hmm. So is there like any possibility that they, that they could actually be facultatively, you know, have their own ability to now replicate their their chloroplast for a dozen or a hundred generations and then just lose it i yeah so it's a great question john and um as we learn more about how much of the ciliates metabolism that nucleus is running it complicates my answer because i'm like well is it really that they're losing the ability to retain to maintain the chloroplast or are they losing other things but so let mm. me tell you all a little bit more about the natural history of, of this kleptocarion of the stolen nucleus um or our observations of it which is that um we after a pre a feeding event will see that nucleus show up and it will be adjacent to the ciliate nuclei in the way that was sort of diagrammed in those little cartoons but over time without additional feeding you see that uh, stolen nucleus enlarge and sort of like look like it's kind of breaking down it stains more diffusely um and it seems to me that the bottleneck for mesodinium is actually the retention and and replication of the nucleus itself and so depending on whether we're depending on the temperature that we're growing these cells at, we're talking about a nucleus that's going to stick around for five days to two weeks and is not going to be able to be divided and passed on to daughter cells. So it may be that there are some genes that are getting ported successfully into the macronucleus and maybe can be replicated with the ciliate's own genetic machinery, but it doesn't seem like we've got wholesale incorporation of everything in that nucleus and at least not everything that's needed given that we see this kind of repeated pattern of degradation and loss. Well, okay, thanks. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any other questions? so much again for the great talk and thank you everybody else for coming we will be continuing i believe in three weeks so so a, a little longer of a wait than usual but don't panic uh it's going to be robin snyder giving a talk on march 
26. So hope to see you all there. And until then, have a good rest of your day. And thank you again for coming. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Thanks everyone. so much for the invitation. Good to see oh, you all. Oh, you're so welcome. Bye-bye.